All right. Good afternoon. I hope you're doing well. It's a bit of a dreary day here in Austin, Texas, but I have my cup of coffee here. Uh, welcome to episode 7 of The Four Voiced Witness. Today, we are going to be discussing the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, which includes the genealogy of Jesus. And so I have titled today's episode, Talking About My Generations, of course, a reference to the classic song by The Who, My Generation. Before we proceed to that discussion, though, to review our discussion from last time, uh, we tried to summarize as best we could the literary lineage of the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, we described the Synoptic problem. So the idea here is what is the relationship, the literary relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke? These are known as the synoptic gospels, the term synoptic coming from a Greek-derived term meaning to see together Matthew, Mark, and Luke generally recount the same events. And so the material that they present us with uh, is sort of categorized as being synoptic. Um, so you have some material that is shared by all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, some tradition that is only shared by Matthew and Luke and not Mark. Um, but the puzzle is, how do we explain the ways that these texts interlock, especially since Mark seems to be the common denominator? Uh, almost the entirety of Mark is reproduced in Matthew and about Half of Mark is reproduced in Luke. So how do we explain uh, sort of how this comes to be? Um, and we ruled out the idea that these are three independent Gospels, uh, literarily independent, that is, all relying on some common set of oral tradition or some uh, set of Hebrew writings or Hebrew gospel. Um, there are way too many similarities between these three texts for all three of them to be literarily independent. So all that means is that based on what we see in the Synoptic Gospels, somebody is copying from somebody else. Somebody is reading somebody else. How do we know this? Well, we sort of briefly considered the ideas of verbatim agreements. There are long strings of word-for-word -word agreements uh, between uh, the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, we looked in particular at a 28-word string of verbatim agreement uh, in Matthew 11 and Luke 10. Uh, on a more general level, these Gospels present basically the same stories in basically the same order and with basically the same details. Uh, generally speaking, Luke follows Mark's order. Uh, the order of Mark's narrative is pretty much reproduced in Luke with the exception of chapters 6 through 8 of Mark. Um, and even though there are differences and kind of different spins that... Uh, different authors put on the events, uh, those differences aren't really enough to make a convincing case that these three Gospels are literarily independent. We also looked at an example of an editorial comment, let the reader understand, being included uh, in two Gospels. And so somewhere along the way, these editorial comments, these comments on the part of and author are being included in the tradition. And so this suggests that there is literary dependence among these Gospels. Um, and so we looked at two possible solutions for how we get from Mark 
as the sort of first gospel to be written to Mark and then Matthew and Luke, obviously reusing bits of Matthew. Uh, and we looked at two possible solutions, the fairer theory and the two slash four source theory. In the fairer theory, you have Mark as the original gospel and then Matthew using Mark as a source and then Luke using both Mark and Matthew as a source. This solution to the synoptic problem kind of focuses on re or not reusing, but uh, explaining the puzzle using the the gospels that we have. Um, we also have the two slash four source theory, which attempts to explain the similarities between Matthew and Luke and Mark using sort of hypothetical documents that we don't actually have. Um, so this explains the synoptic puzzle by positing that there are these other sources, Q, M, and L, that contain some of this shared material. And in the case of M and L, those documents hypothetically contain unique material. So the stuff that's unique to Matthew, unique to Luke, uh, supposedly comes from these other sources. Um, and, you know, the thing to keep in mind, uh, and this is sort of the conclusion that I attempted to present at the end of our discussion last week, is that both the fairer theory and the two-source slash four-source theory are perfectly reasonable ways to explain uh, the interconnectedness of the synoptic gospels. Uh, we don't want to shy away from the two-source theory or the four-source theory simply because it's kind of theoretical in a way that might make us a little uncomfortable. And at the end of the day, um, what I want you to get out of all this synoptic problem stuff isn't the idea that you, as a reader of Scripture, need to be actively conscious of Q or these hypothetical sources or, you know, even even something a little bit simpler and cleaner like the fairer theory. Um, the goal is to be aware of the very connected relationships between the synoptic gospels. It's to be aware of the fact that the gospel tradition, as we have it in scripture, is very self-referential. We have authors um, using material, shared material, in different ways to make different points, different theological emphases. Um, and so the point is that we want to acknowledge the fact that the synoptic gospels are, are different, uh, and we want to be aware of that. Um, and we also want to be aware of the fact that those differences don't need to threaten our conception of the truthfulness and veracity of scripture. So, having said that, uh, I was kind of unsure where to go next. So we've talked about these literary rela relationships between the synoptic gospels. And I mentioned last week that Mark in priority, the idea that Mark is the earliest gospel that we have, that is basically taken for granted, I would say, in modern New Testament scholarship. And so, I wanted to move towards discussing individual Gospels. So we've been spending a lot of time on sort of uh, traditions behind the Gospels, the way that the Gospel tradition uh, relates to itself in order to produce the synoptic Gospels. Um, but in terms of thinking about individual Gospels, you know, what what is the next step? Do we start talking about Mark? Do we go the, the Markan priority route and say, well, Mark was the first gospel, and so that is the gospel that we should discuss first? Or do we go with Matthew? You know, Matthew is uh, canonically, in terms of how your Bible is laid out, the first gospel, right? So what is the first gospel? Is it Mark? Or is it Matthew? That's an interesting question. 
And depending on how you answer it, that might uh, give some clues as to uh, where some of your priorities lie. No pun intended with the word priorities there, but. Interestingly, by and large, ancient Christians regarded Matthew as the first gospel. Um, some examples of that. Uh, Papias, in the second century. I mentioned Papias, uh, I believe, two weeks ago in the context of talking about eyewitness tradition. Papias connects Matthew with Jesus' teaching in Hebrew. So Papias seems to think that the Gospel of Matthew uh, preserves Jesus' teaching in Hebrew in some way. So there's a connection between the Gospel of Matthew and the Hebrew language. Uh, even though, interestingly, Papias thinks that Mark was actually written first, he assigns this importance to Matthew as being a preserver of Jesus' teaching in Hebrew. Origen, in the 3rd century, notes that According to him, Matthew was the first gospel to be written. So Matthew is chronologically the first gospel, according to Origen. Uh, not only this, but Origen thought that Matthew was written in Hebrew and that it was primarily intended for Jewish Christians. So again, there is a connection being drawn between the gospel of Matthew and the Hebrew language. On into the 4th century, Chrysostom. He notes that Matthew begins with a genealogy, which will be the primary subject of our discussion today, in order to win over Jews by presenting an explicitly Davidic and Jewish Messiah. And so, with all of these different figures from the first few centuries of the church, we see connections being made between the Gospel of Matthew and Hebrew, the Gospel of Matthew and the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. Okay. So there ends up being this very strong association between the Gospel of Matthew and Judaism. And so, as time went on, and I'm, I'm simplifying a bit here, but as time goes on, this idea that Matthew is, uh, if you want to think of it this way, sort of the Jewish gospel, there's this idea that Matthew is not only connected with Jewishness, but also that Matthew is older because of these uh, connections, apparently, to sort of the original Jewish Christians. Okay. Um, so, this is kind of interesting. Um, you know, I am, I am very uh, positively disposed towards the church fathers. Uh, you know, if you were a part of our, our class on the Apostolic Fathers last semester, you'll know I am not in any way sort of skittish when it comes to thinking positively about the church fathers and what they had to say, but it, it is sort of inescapable that this is historically incorrect. Uh, Matthew was objectively not the first gospel to be written. Mark was. And Matthew, just like the other gospel authors, wrote in Greek and not Hebrew. And so... All of these connections to Hebrew and Aramaic and and sort of the Jewish context, while there there are some valid things in there, uh, they do not equate Matthew being the first gospel. But you know this this notion that Matthew was the first gospel uh, had quite a strong hold on, uh, I would say, the the imagination of the church, so much so that in the canonical ordering of the Gospels, Matthew has traditionally been placed 
first. So again, you know, do we do we say, you know, when we're thinking about the first gospel, do we sort of discount uh, what the fathers said about Matthew and say, well, now we know better and Mark was technically the first gospel, so we'll sort of give Mark a place at the head of the canon. Well, we haven't done that. Uh, our Bibles still have Matthew first, even though the notion of uh, Mark's originality has been around for over 200 years. In, in every Bible that you see, Matthew comes before Mark. And, you know, while we, again, cannot sort of say that Matthew is older chronologically, th there's still something that is, I would say, foundational about Matthew. Uh, as I said, you know, Matthew kind of stood at the head of the gospel collection for centuries. And so throughout Christian history, Matthew has held this sort of foundational position among the four gospels. But also in terms of its content, Matthew lays this foundation for the story of Jesus in the Jewish context. So Matthew presents in his gospel a specifically Jewish Jesus. And of course, the other gospels bring out Jesus's Jewishness in, in their own way, or they they access that, that aspect of Jesus' identity in their own way. But as we'll see today, there's kind of this foundational level at which Matthew is intending to tell the story of a, a specifically Jewish Jesus. And I think at some level, the early Christians recognized this. You know, when they are... Uh, making references to, you know, the Hebrew language, you know, however valid or invalid their conclusions may have been, the notion that that was in some way important, that Jesus' Jewish identity and his connection to the people of Israel was important, you know, there there is something to that that is important. and. So that caused them, among other things, but, you know, that caused them to place Matthew's gospel at the head of the collection of four gospels. Um, and so my goal over the next, well, three weeks after this, um, is to to turn to each of the four Gospels and to ask some questions about how they work together to present the story of Jesus. How do they function, not necessarily individually, but as, as a group of four to witness to Jesus? So the title of this class is The Four-Voiced Witness. And, you know, if you're interested in things like who wrote each of the four Gospels, when were they written, uh, who were they written for, questions like that, um, there are plenty of places you can go to find that information. Um, I can even direct you to some resources. But my, my goal is not to, to try to address those questions. I am more interested in this particular class in how the four Gospels combine their voices to witness to Jesus. The four-voiced witness, kind of keying off of uh, the four living creatures from Ezekiel and from Revelation that we began this class with. So I want to know how the Gospel of Matthew lays a foundation for the rest of the Gospels. In what way 
does the Gospel of Matthew root the story of Jesus in the story of Israel? How, how does the, this, the first gospel, if you want to think of it that way, and I think we can legitimately think of Matthew as the first gospel uh, in the sense of its foundational importance. In what way is the gospel of Matthew an appropriate beginning to the story of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom, if that makes sense? So I'm, I'm going to try not to do too much today. I really just want to focus on uh, on that that one thing. And we're really, we are just going to focus on one part of Matthew. Um, and that is the genealogy. Uh, I'm going to be sort of taking a lot of cues from uh, Francis Watson's The Fourfold Gospel his chapter on Matthew, because I think he, he makes a lot of great uh, observations about sort of this, this foundational nature of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, all right, enough throat clearing. Let's go. So, when we think of the Gospel of Matthew, one of the elements of the very beginning of the gospel that you're most likely at least a little bit familiar with is Jesus's genealogy. And I'll actually pull up Matthew. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I just I just want to kind of a, at a bird's eye sort of level show you the, just the space that is taken up by Jesus's genealogy. The Gospel of Matthew begins by highlighting Jesus's human lineage, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David the son of Abraham. Um, so th these first few paragraphs are taken up with Jesus's genealogy. And then the actual birth of Jesus is described. So Jesus is initially identified as Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And the genealogy ends with the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. And he proceeds to say, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. And so there's kind of a movement from this very broad context of Jesus's ancestors to then the very specific circumstances of his actual birth. Now, if you're paying attention, I'll bring Matthew back here. Um, so number one, you know, we, we are told that uh, Jesus is born of Mary, who is a virgin. So if we think of uh, sort of the this interaction between Joseph and the angel. The angel comes to tell Joseph what's about to happen. Uh, Matthew identifies this as fulfillment of prophecy. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So the point here, though, is that this genealogy extends to Joseph. Right? So this miraculous virgin birth essentially negates this entire genealogy. Why does this genealogy, this recounting of this list of ancestors matter if Jesus isn't even technically biologically connected to them? Because the point of connection for Jesus is Joseph, who is not his actual biological father. 
As Watson notes, the miraculous birth seems to cancel out the genealogy. So, does the author of Matthew just not know how genealogies work? You know, what, what, what's going on here? Why are we taken through this entire string of uh, genealogical history if it doesn't really have any direct bearing on Jesus himself? What's the deal? And the thing to know about this is that this is not so much about physical lineage. Uh, Jesus's family tree is rather an embodiment of the story of Israel. And so, the point here is that Matthew is showing us that Jesus has been born into the same story that we see in the Hebrew Scriptures. So, uh, we begin with the patriarchs, as you might expect. Abraham, thought to be sort of the, the primary father of the Jewish people. Um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, sort of the, the three primary patriarchs. Uh, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Huh. Okay. That's interesting. Um, at Redeemer Presbyterian, not too terribly long ago, uh, we were doing a sermon series on Genesis, and we went through the story of uh, Judah and Tamar. Uh, and I won't recount the whole thing, but the gist is that in order for Tamar to procure justice for herself, uh, she essentially tricked her father-in-law, Judah, into fathering a child with her. Um, and there's a whole complicated set of things around what that story is and means and all of that. But this clues us into the fact that this is about more than just biological connection. Uh, as Francis Watson notes, you know, if you look at what's actually said here, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. It could have just said Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah. It didn't have to mention Tamar. But the fact that Tamar is mentioned, Matthew is pointing us to that whole story. We are being prompted to recall the history of the people of Israel. Not just the sort of normal parts, not just the good parts, but perhaps some of the shameful parts as well. Um, and so even from sort of this early stage in Jesus's genealogy, we can tell that this is about more than just biological connection. If this were just about who fathered who, then this would probably look a little bit different. Uh, we also get to Rahab, Boaz, Ruth. Um, so here we've got uh, some instances of sort of explicit uh, Gentile inclusion into the people of Israel. Um, and it, it's probably worth pointing out that um, 
there are lots of different takes out there about uh, why uh, specifically women, and specifically these women, are mentioned in Jesus' genealogy. Um, I sort of won't try to address those things today, but it's that's a really interesting uh, set of questions on its own. But at least for Rahab and Ruth, those are instances where um, Gentile women are included in the story of Israel. So Rahab, uh, one of the uh, Canaanites who assisted Israel's spies before the conquest of the land, uh, Ruth, a Moabitess, included in the people of Israel uh, by, uh, by Boaz. And then we get to some more familiar names. Uh, and interestingly, it says that David fathered Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now, if you are familiar with the story of David, you are no doubt familiar with the story of Bathsheba. Um, you have this whole situation where David uh, sort of notices Bathsheba, uh, seizes her, has his way with her, and then uh, later on has her husband Uriah killed so that he can take Bathsheba as his wife. Uh, a particularly shameful episode in the story of David prompting the prophet Nathan to confront him and bring him to repentance. Um, now, the child that uh, David and Bathsheba uh, conceived initially, um, I believe, was... Uh, stricken with an illness and ultimately died. But the, the point I want to make here is that in Second Samuel, uh, Bathsheba is, is referred to as the wife of Uriah only up until the death of that child. After that point, she is not referred to as the wife of Uriah, but as the wife of David. And so... Interestingly, number one, again, this is about more than biological connection. Story points from David's history are being included in the story of Jesus' ancestors. Um, but also, it doesn't just say David fathered Solomon, but it is including the fact that Bathsheba became David's wife because of this uh, shameful episode. And so the complexity of that story, you know, much like the situation with Judah and Tamar, the complexity of the story of David, the complexity of the story of Israel is embedded in Jesus' story. And so Jesus' genealogy is uh, sort of punctuated with these very complex uh, shameful stories from the history of Israel. And I think it is clear that, that this is not just a list of ancestors, but this is uh, a story sort of in microcosm of the history of God's people, both in ways that are positive and, and in ways that, that are not. The story of, of God's faithfulness amidst uh, complex, complex situations amidst human sin, amidst all those things. Um, and we can see a contrast here with other similar sorts of genealogies. If you look at the genealogy that's found in uh, First Chronicles two, uh, it presents some of the same information a list of ancestors. 
Um, however, as Francis Watson points out, the purpose of the genealogy in First Chronicles 2 seems largely to be the presentation of information. There's no sort of shape to the story that is being told through this genealogy. Uh, it's, it's much more a record of names and less sort of a narrative unto itself. Whereas in Matthew, it's obvious that there is, there's kind of a shape to the genealogy. There's a story that's being told through it. Uh, the information has been uh, shaped a little bit. And so the goal seems to be, at least in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, to show that the story of Israel, this long, complicated history, has in fact culminated now in the birth of the Messiah. So the point here is not simply to show that Jesus is an Israelite or to show that he is related to David, although that is sort of a side effect, I think. But, you know, the, the overarching purpose is to firmly... Uh, place Jesus within the context of Israel's story. Okay. So, ultimately, we can see that Joseph is explicitly not Jesus' father. There is no way that, uh, based on this genealogy and based on the events that are recounted uh, in the chapters that follow, uh, there is no biological connection between Joseph and Jesus. Uh, Joseph's role in the story is uh, that of a protector, a father figure, perhaps, but he is not Jesus' biological father. And so, perhaps obviously, this genealogy's purpose is not biological. Um, and there is a significance to that as well. So the genealogy does show that Jesus is a, a product of Israel's story. He is not uh, born outside of Israel's story, but rather into it. But at the same time, because there is no biological connection with Joseph, this points to the fact that Jesus is, although he is born into Israel's story, he is not born into Israel's uh, sin. The pattern of sinfulness, especially in the line of David, you know, David's sins basically caused God to, uh, to afflict his house with violence from generation to generation afterwards. Um, Jesus is not subject to, to that sort of hereditary sin. And so, again, uh, quoting Watson here, in view of this history, Joseph cannot be the father of a Messiah who will save his people from their sins. This history cannot deliver itself from the burden of its past. The coming of the Messiah must be an act of God. Jesus saves his people from within their situation, not as a deus ex machina from without. And so both of these things, both Jesus being, the birth of Jesus being contextualized within Israel's story, but also the miraculous divine origins of Jesus' birth, set him up as the one who is simultaneously born into this history, but can also save Israel from their own history, if that makes sense. So, even from the very first chapter of Matthew, and, I mean, th there's much more that, that could be said about this, but again, I'm trying to sort of not try to take on too much here. 
the Gospel of Matthew is, in fact, an appropriate place to begin the Gospel of the Kingdom. It is an appropriate starting place for the continuation of Israel's story. Um, the biblical story is largely about Israel in the Hebrew Bible. And so the good news of the kingdom, the good news of salvation, the good news of God fulfilling his covenant promises to Israel, it must begin with Israel as well. And so we see in Matthew's genealogy the gospel author portraying Jesus as a specifically Jewish Messiah. I've mentioned before how Matthew portrays Jesus as a teacher, a Jewish teacher. So Matthew's portrayal of Jesus as Jewish teacher, Jewish Messiah, it appropriately begins with this genealogy that contextualizes Jesus in the story of the Jewish people. Uh, and this places the words and deeds of Jesus in continuity with God's work within history on behalf of his people. I just realized my face is probably a little bit bigger. Um, so, in that respect, I think what the early Christians observed about the, the Jewish character of Matthew, even if I sort of disagree with the, the linguistic and historical grounds upon which they based those conclusions, their ideas about the Jewish character of Matthew, is a, th those conclusions are appropriate. Uh, and I, I think this also gets at both the necessity and the specificity of the Incarnation. Um, when we think about the idea that Jesus rules the world, we sometimes jump to the notion that, well, he's, he is God, so yes, he rules the world. But also, he rules the world as a Jewish man. A Jewish man rules the world. God has fulfilled his promise to David that one of David's descendants would have an everlasting throne and would rule the world. He has fulfilled that in Christ. But Christ is, is still, in his incarnated body, he is still a Jewish man. It's an interesting thing to think about. The incarnation was not only necessary, it was specific. Jesus wasn't just any man, he was a, a Jewish man, and there are very important reasons for that in terms of how Jesus, as a Jew, saved not only Israel, but the entire world. If you remember from our first session, I talked about the, the four living creatures. Uh, the creature with the face of a lion, the face of a man, the face of an eagle, and the face of an ox. And we talked about how each of those symbols, the, the four creatures, has commonly been associated with the four Gospels in Christian theology. Uh, and depending on, you know, different, different church fathers and different theologians over the centuries have associated different creatures with different, different Gospels. Um, but Matthew is often associated with the face of the man. And I think that is, you know, for all the reasons that I've been pointing to, that, that is appropriate. Um, sometimes that's explained because, well, the, the Jesus of of Matthew is, is a human Jesus, and we see him showing compassion on people and things of that nature. And there may be something to that. Um, a, a, a human compassionate Jesus, 
I'm fine with that. But also, I think Matthew points to, as I said, the specificity of the incarnation. And so in Matthew, we sort of see not only the face of Jesus, but his specifically Jewish face. The specific culture and context that he was born into. And the story of the people that he was born into. And how that, that actually impacts um, God's people. And so it is perhaps appropriate that we associate Matthew with, with the face of, of the man uh, in, in Ezekiel terms. So I think I'm actually going to, to sort of stop there. Um, next time we'll be discussing the Gospel of Mark. And once again, my goal is not to to exhaustively discuss each gospel. Um, that would take more time than we have. Um, but rather to point to unique features about each gospel that contribute to their collective witness to Jesus. Uh, and so next time we'll be looking at the gospel of Mark. Um, I do want to at least speak to, at some level, the question of when the Gospels were written. I think I will do that after we have discussed all four. Uh, we'll take some time to talk about that. Um, you know, we're kind of moving from the traditions behind the Gospels to the unique features of the Gospels themselves that bind them together as the fourfold witness to then their, their writing down of these Gospels and their reception in the church. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, but yeah, the Gospel of Mark will be next. Uh, if you have any questions about anything I've said today or anything related to the Gospels, related to uh, the New Testament, theology, anything like that, I'd be happy to address those. Uh, send them to me uh, either via Facebook, YouTube comments, or you can email me or message me in some way, and I'd be happy to address those next week. Um, I am planning on taking a week off for spring break. I will let you know when that is coming up. But otherwise, I will see you next Sunday back here, 3 p.m., for another episode of the four-voiced witness. Until then, peace be with you.